Well, hey there, friends in ADHD. Russ Barkley back again, back in flannel. What are you going to do? I am a grandfather, and we like to wear this stuff when it's cold weather outside. So uh, this is our Saturday Research Roundup for this week. And as always, we begin our Research Roundup with a dad joke. So here's this week's dad joke for you. Why did the koala bear get the job? Because he was qualified. <laughs> I'm going to lose subscribers over that one, I'm sure, but it's worth the price, isn't it? Okay, this week we're going to focus on four studies of the many that were published. All of the studies I was able to find over the last week are posted in the description, and then I give you the link to the four that I discuss in this particular video. So let's get started. First up is a very large study out of Sweden that actually made it into the trade media this week, and it is on the impact of ADHD medications on claims for work disability and mental health outcomes. So very important study. This one involved more than 221,000 individuals with ADHD. So it was published over on the website for JAMA Network Open. JAMA stands for Journal of the American Medical Association, if you're not familiar with it. This particular study used all of the health records available in the Swedish population. As you know, they have public health over there, and they have a national database, and it allows for doing this kind of very large large-scale research. So this study was specifically looking at the impact of taking ADHD medications, particularly the stimulant medications, over there it's usually amphetamines, and whether or not individuals had been hospitalized in a mental hospital, also whether or not there had been a non-psychiatric hospitalization, and whether there had been any suicide attempts and death by suicide. So we're comparing on and off medication on these particular outcomes. So what did they find? As it says here, out of this total of nearly a quarter million people with ADHD, they found that uh, methylphenidate was commonly given, as were the amphetamines. About 68% took methylphenidate, and about 35 to 40% took the amphetamines. So like stand corrected on what I said at the opening. This was mainly a study of methylphenidate, but they looked at the impact of these stimulant medications on those outcomes, and here's what they found. The following medications were associated with a reduction in risk for psychiatric hospitalization, and it was, of course, amphetamine, Lizdex amphetamine, and polydrug therapy. So very important there. They also found that the stimulants were associated with a reduction in non-psychiatric hospitalizations. And also, uh, they found that there was a reduction in suicide attempts and in suicide success, that is, death by suicide. So important to note here is that they also looked at the non-stimulant medications, atomoxetine, clonidine, guanfacine that we use here, uh, and they did not find any association of those drugs with a reduced likelihood of hospitalization in a mental hospital or with a reduction in suicidal behavior or success. But they did find that the stimulants were associated with reductions in those outcomes. So a very important nationwide study here, once again showing the importance of medication in reducing risks in people with ADHD. Last week I covered the reduction in risks for uh, mortality, all-cause mortality, mortality by accidental injury as well, showing that there was a substantial reduction in the risk of death as a consequence of taking medication if you had ADHD. So uh, again, very important study there. Let's move on and take a look at the second study. This one comes out of Korea, and it's a meta-analysis of studies looking at the pragmatic speech abilities 
of people with ADHD. Most of this research is done with children. The authors found 19 studies that they were able to include in their meta-analysis, and overall they found that ADHD was associated with a significant degree of impairment in pragmatic language or pragmatic speech, uh, a, a nearly doubling of the prevalence of pragmatic problems in people with ADHD over the typical population. So what is pragmatic speech? It's the use of speech to accomplish a goal, whether we're talking with other people, whether we're trying to explain something to others, whether we've been asked to stand up and give a report in class or describe uh, what we might have read over the weekend or in last night's homework. It's this attempt to organize language for the sake of accomplishing some sort of goal, hence the term pragmatic. Uh, and we've known for years, going back to the 1960s, that ADHD was associated with a variety of expressive language problems, primarily in pragmatic abilities. And this review is just the icing on that cake, looking at all of those past studies and showing that there's a significant problem with goal-directed speech and its organization in people with ADHD. So shout out to our Korean colleagues for doing a nice meta-analysis there. The third study was in the Journal of Affective Disorders, and this was done by researchers over in Italy. So we've got quite an international representation today uh, in this research review. And this was examining adults with ADHD and their risk for substance use disorders. Nothing new there. We've covered this many times on this channel, ADHD does predispose towards substance use disorders, and they of course found that again in this study of about, let's see, I think it was uh, 136 adults with ADHD in their study, and they found that about 35% of them had a substance use disorder of one sort or another. More important to this particular study is they were looking at certain mediators of that risk, like predictors of that risk. Can you look at adults with ADHD and say, all right, this particular trait is going to increase their risk of substance use disorder? What they found is that irritable temperament was much more associated with the risk of an adult with ADHD moving on to a substance use disorder. So interesting that irritable temperament would be linked with risk of SUDS. It's important, however, to point out, it's just correlational findings. The irritable temperament could actually be a consequence of the use of substances, but it also possible that it's a mediating characteristic of that risk. They also found that besides irritable temperament, that frequent school failure, legal problems, and lifetime suicide attempts were also highly associated with the substance use disorder in adults with ADHD. So those might be other risk factors, either predisposing towards substance use, or again, the opposite could be true, substance use disorders are leading to these other difficulties that I've mentioned. So uh, once again, I always caution you, correlation is not causation. These are correlational results, uh, but they suggest that there's some degree of relationship between irritable temperament and substance use disorders in adults with ADHD. Okay, last up, another international study, this one out of China. This is a follow-up study of a group of adults with ADHD that were randomly assigned to receive medication only, and those who got medication plus a cognitive behavioral therapy intervention. We've talked previously here that CBT for adult ADHD is the second evidence-based treatment for ADHD, second only to medication. And there are several programs out there, such as by Mary Salanto, also by Steve Safran, and my friend Russ Ramsey, all have programs with manuals on doing CBT for adult ADHD. All of these programs focus on the executive function deficits linked to adult ADHD, as did this particular program. Now, important to note is this is the one-year follow-up, and they're looking at what predicted success in 
these groups. So first of all, they report, by the way, this appeared over in the journal BMC Psychiatry, the authors report that at the one-year follow-up, the group that received CBT with medication exceeded the group that got medication only in terms of reductions in their ADHD symptoms, but also reductions in depressive symptoms, as well as maladaptive uh, quality of life, that is psychological quality of life that was poor. They found that there was much better quality of life in these individuals. That didn't seem to be too much difference in what are called maladaptive cognitions or thoughts in the group that received CBT versus a group that did not, but the other three outcomes were improved by the addition of CBT to medication. So this isn't the first study to show that. A number of previous studies have also found that while CBT can be effective for helping people with ADHD, that when medication is added to CBT, there are additional benefits that CBT provides beyond simply what medication would ordinarily be doing. So, all right, that's our research roundup for this Saturday. I hope you found it useful. I hope if you're not a subscriber, once again, uh, think about subscribing to the channel or recommending us to others. And I thank those of you who already are subscribers for making this a highly successful venture in getting information out to people with ADHD or those with a need to know about ADHD. We're having a much wider reach than I did when I first started this channel, and that's all thanks to you for recommending this channel to others. So thanks, everybody. I look forward to seeing you later in the week with other commentaries and even more dad jokes next weekend. Uh, in the meantime, as I always conclude, be well, everybody.